All right. I guess uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I know it's uh, Monday afternoon and Mondays can be tough days, uh, you know, getting getting through a weekend and finding all your problems for the beginning of the week. So I uh, certainly appreciate your time today and hopefully uh, hopefully you learn a little something today and, and we'll just jump right into it. We're going to talk about managing drought stress as part of your IPM. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uh, problems associated with drought and um, it can it can really um, affect pesticide use in a couple different ways uh, and we want to we want to limit that and, and we want to have nice uh, nice trees you know plants shrubs turf uh, so we're going to talk about um, kind of go through it and uh, we'll just get get started here All right, the big picture here, right? Plants that experience less stress will actively resist pest attacks, All right? So uh, drought is one of our biggest stressors. Um, it's almost unavoidable in, in most of, of our uh, geographic areas at some point in the year. Uh, drought stress on turf in the landscape. So drought stress can be a primary contributor to stress that leads to insect and disease pressure. So plants under drought are gonna be um, less tolerate, they're gonna to tolerate less um, uh, to all of the factors that um, create disease. They're, they're gonna be more susceptible to insects, et cetera. And then we'll talk about some drought management. You know, what, what, what tools are out there? What do, what do we have at our disposal to help mitigate some drought other than, um, you know, irrigation, obviously. <clears throat> So first, um, you know, we have to look at uh, biotic versus abiotic stresses, right? So when you start diagnosing uh, what's going on in your landscape, um, you know, this is, this is a, a big key point here, right? So biotic plant problems are caused by living organisms, right? Such as fungi, bacteria, viruses, nematodes, insects, mites, and animals. Um, abiotic disorders are caused by non-living factors such as drought stress, sun scald, freeze injury, wind injury, chemical drift, nutrient deficiency, improper cultural practices such as overwatering or even planting too deep. Um, this is important um, because the first step in, in any kind of IPM program is going to be identify what that problem is. Uh, there are a lot of different um, problems that can present in a number of different ways, and many of them are uh, very similar. Um, so uh, first, first we have to figure out, you know, is this a uh, biotic problem that, that um, you know, we need an insecticide for, for example, or, or is this an abiotic disorder? Uh, we can work around some other way other than using uh, pesticides. <clears throat> so uh, a biotic um, is going to result from damage done by other living organisms. Um, they're often uh, naturally occurring and, and intangible, where abiotic um, is, is going to be the negative impact on non-living factors. So the non-living variable must influence the environment beyond its normal range of variation to adversely affect the population performance or ind individual physiology of the organism in a significant way. So that's a really long way to say that, you know, we have a lot of different factors that affect plants, but most of them are pretty natural. They happen a lot. We go through periods of, say, um, uh, lower rainfall than others, but we have to get to a point um, where that actually uh, starts to affect the plant. Um, abiotic stress is essentially unavoidable. Um, it, it's going to affect everything. You know, it's just a matter of, is that abiotic factor something that we actually need to, to worry about and treat? Is it going to get to the point where it stresses a plant um, enough that, that we need to do something about it? Um, abiotic stress affects animals. Um, you know, it affects us. If, if you get sunburnt, that was an, an abiotic stressor on you. Uh, but plants are especially dependent on environmental factors. You know, they go out, they, they live outside and, and photosynthesis and they're, they're 
they see all the weather, you know, we just had tornadoes come through and, and you know, them knocking trees down, that, that was an abiotic uh, factor there. So um, abiotic stress is the most harmful factor concerning the growth and productivity of crops worldwide. Um, you know, you're, you're gonna have a lot more abiotic factors uh, destroying things and, and factoring into uh, that growth and productivity. And research has also shown that abiotic stressors are at their most harmful when they occur together in combinations of abiotic stress factors. So we have a um, nice little chart here. Uh, competition, alleopathy, herbivory, diseases, insects, those are all biotic. Those are generally going to be a little easier to diagnose. Um, abiotic can be physical, it can be chemical. There, there is such a wide range of, of what these can be. So is it uh, too hot, right? Is it um, uh, drought? Is it too dry? Is it too wet? Uh, radiation and infrared and UV, is it getting too much light? Not enough light. Um, I just mentioned tornadoes, right? Wind. And we have chemical as well, right? Is there air pollution, pesticides? Uh, toxins, did you dump something out where you shouldn't have? Um, soil and water pH, right? People talk about soil pH all the time, but you know, what's the pH of your tank that, that you're mixing with? You know, that, can, that can affect it as well. And, and also salinity, obviously. Uh, most plants uh, don't, don't like salt. So <laughs> as we identify um, abiotic versus biotic, Right, so biotic, uh, it can spread within plants and to neighboring plants. Right, that's a big one. Um, you you might see um, particularly you know a, a disease coming in, and, and you start to see small circles that can coalesce into larger circles. Well, we would be able to say that that was uh, a disease by seeing something like that. Um, they're often limited to similar species of plant. So again, disease is a great example where you might have a stand of, of multiple different types of turf grasses, for example, um, and, and only have disease on, on one particular type. And so it, it may appear uh, modeled and, and um, the rest of your turf stand might be uh, still you know, very healthy. Um, and then physical evidence, right? Are there a presence of insects? Um, do you see cast skins? Do you see mycelium in the morning? You know, it looks like uh, uh, spider webs in the turf, right? Um, or on your nets, fungal, um, spores, et cetera. Um, whereas abiotic damage, is, it's gonna be more localized, right? It, it can't, it generally doesn't travel from one plant to another plant over time. Um, and it may affect all of the species, right? If, if say, a, a a deer comes wandering along, he might eat lots of different plants. Now, if you don't see that deer and you come out and you've got some plants that are kind of half destroyed, sometimes that might look like an insect, it could. Um, but if, if, uh, if it's a lot of different species, you know, we, that, that's one of our clues there. Um, and even no physical evidence on the plant, that's, that's generally uh, gonna be abiotic damage. So some of the factors leading to abiotic injury, um, water is probably the number one, I would guess, either excess or deficiency, either uh, overwatering, underwatering, drought conditions. Um, you know, how, how well does your soil take in water? Uh, salts and uh, bicarbonates, uh, what's, your, what's your water source? You know, is it, is it effluent water? Is it a, a well, you know, full of, uh, bicarbs that um, is certainly going to start, um, you know, destroying soil st structure and, and leading to some, some issues. Uh, nutrients, excess or deficiency. Uh, so, you know, too much, too much is bad, not enough is bad. You're, you'll start seeing problems either way. Uh, sunlight, right? Are, 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 you, are you growing the wrong plant in, in, the, in the wrong spots? Is there um, not enough light or too much light for that plant? Um, and, and that can change over time, right? If you have a, say you have a landscape and you have some shrubs that start growing larger than others. And, you know, the next thing you know, you know, your, your plants in the front of that, you know, maybe the way the sun comes across, now they're not getting an, as much light. And you have to be able to um, 
diagnose that that issue. Um, adverse soil conditions, um, a, a lot of those fall along what we what we've already talked about. Um, temperature extremes, uh, animal traffic, right? Digging, dog urine, um, and then there's the human touch, right? We we do lots of things um, that that really can hurt uh, our, our plants, our landscapes. Um, you know, contaminated water, spills, misapplication. I, I can't tell you how many, how many misapplications I've seen in my lifetime. Uh, that could be just as simple as, uh, you know, doing the math on a tank and, and, you know, dividing the wrong number and, and you have twice as much as you need or even just over, you know, over application on, um, on your overlaps, you know, that sort of thing. Um, machinery traffic, uh, dull mower blades, you know, that's, that's seems like such a simple thing, but um, you get some jagged edges and, and now you have a place for, uh, for your pathogens to come into. So, so just some examples of some various uh, injury here. Um, I'm not sure who did this application on the left, but uh, not, not very even. Um, this might have been a disgruntled employee. Uh, in the middle here, you, you see these trees, right? Our trees have nice big roots. Our grass plants, not, not nearly as such. So you'll start seeing your drought stresses uh, in those areas first. You know, they're, they're just going to compete for water. And then the top here, this is actually heat, heat caused, right? It was too hot. And, and too droughty and, and um, you know, machine came over this turf and basically um, these are just tire marks. Generally this will grow out, but imagine if this is what one of your customer's properties look like because you came out when you shouldn't have. Um, <clears throat> I would say this middle one is probably somebody, uh, you know, maybe dumped a, a bottle of something out there. Uh, and that's, that's probably the way the water flows when it rains and it took it right through um, compaction issues, right? People walking on this all the time and, and heat from, from the concrete. And um, this is probably a cold morning and somebody walked through very frozen uh, turf, if I had to guess. Um, you know, if we see these type of things, you know, we should, and th these are very obvious, right? We wouldn't look at this and say, um, I think there's insects creating these, these footprints, right? But some of these aren't, they're not quite as, as obvious. They, they can be a little bit tougher. So it, it's really important that we, you know, recognize that there are a number of factors that can create injury that aren't pests, right? We don't want to just start throwing uh, insecticides, pesticides into the world for no reason. So proper identification. Uh, is it drought stress? Is it salt or bicarbonate toxicity? Nutrient deficiencies. These all can show symptoms that emulate pest damage. So proper identification is the key to avoiding pesticide misuse. And that's, that's kind of the first point that I, that I really want to hammer home here that um, you know, we increase pesticide use in, in a couple different ways. And the first one is that we, we misdiagnose, right? So we don't have a problem, but we put a pesticide out anyway. Um, you know, we always want to, you know, think about all of these other factors that it could be before, before we start, you know, fungicides, insecticides, et cetera. Um, All right, so we'll get into what this what what the talk is about. Mostly, we're, we're going to talk about drought, and um, uh, so what is a drought? All right, a drought is defined as a period of abnormally dry weather sufficiently prolonged for the lack of water to cause serious hydrologic imbalance in the affected area. Right, so that's important because um, you know if if you guys are and, and gals. If you guys follow the weather, which you probably do in this industry, um, you know, you can head off a lot of problems just, just by watching it. You know, is it gonna rain uh, again in the next week? Well, if you're not, 
you're probably going to start entering a drought, you know, depending on time of year, obviously. But, um, you know, cer certainly something to consider that, um, you know, a small period of, of not having water is fine. And it's actually good for most plants. If, if you have water every single day, you know, most plants get lazy uh, and their roots get lazy and they come up to the surface uh, because that's where all the water is. So you want periods of, of dryness in between watering, right? So then your roots will dig deep so that when they do suffer from any kind of actual drought, um, they'll, they'll be more adept at, at finding the water sources and, um, you know, making their way through it. So realize that, um, you know, a, a drought has to be dry enough to actually cause problems, right? Um, so many people are over water. That's, that's probably one of the bigger abiotic factors that I've seen in my career. Um, just, just too much water. So, so there's drought and what's drought stress, right? Drought stress is an abi abiotic stressor that results when water loss from the plant exceeds the ability of the plant's roots to absorb water and when the plant's water content is reduced enough to interfere with normal plant processes. So that second part is the big one here, right? Because as your plant's uh, going into drought stress, all of its internal functions start to start to shut down or they don't work um, as well, right? And so um, that's where we start to see all of our problems. That's where we see, you know, leaf drop and brownness, um, uh, susceptibility to, you know, other uh, problems and pests. Um, so again, you know, don't be scared of not getting water on something. Um, but we do have to you know, be aware that as we enter actual drought stress um, is, is where all of our problems are really going to come from. All right, for perspective of drought, meteorological all right, is a measure of departure or precipitation from normal. All right, like I said, you know, we don't really need to worry too much about that, right? Due to climatic differences, what might be considered a drought in one location of the country may not be a drought in another. Um, again, if, if you're, you can have a little bit of drought without actually getting to the point of drought stress, that, that's what we really want to hone on here. So agricultural refers to a situation where the amount of moisture in the soil no longer meets the needs of a particular crop. That's what we are concerned with. Right? Do we have enough water for that plant, whether it be turf, whether it be ornamentals, flowers, shrubbery, trees? That's, that is our number one concern here. Um, uh, the, but there's also you know, hydrological occurs when surface and subsurface water supplies are below normal. That still can affect uh, our industry um, as, as uh, subsurface water supplies are below normal. You may see municipalities. Uh, start to enact watering restrictions. Um, so now, you know, uh, as a secondary um, factor there, if we can't water like we might want to, now our agricultural drought comes back into play. Um, and then there's socioeconomic uh, drought, which refers to the situation that occurs when physical water sources shortages begin to affect people. Um, obviously, that is a big deal that um, fortunately, uh, we, we don't deal with much of that in this country, but is, this is just kind of showing that drought can be thought of in a, in a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> drought monitor. Um, I, I picked the Southeast. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm just south of Charlotte. Um, this is a fantastic website. Um, you can look all over the country, I believe, on this one. Um, there are a number of um, sites like this that you can find. So if you're not like me and watching the, the weather every day and uh, it's still a habit after 20 years in this industry, um, you know, if you, if you just need to check out where you are, uh, this, is a, this is a really great resource to really hone in. And this helps in a number of different ways, right? Not only does it help you uh, make sure you're, you're 
getting your proper water. You're telling your customers about proper water, but this is also kind of a, um, a cover yourself, you know, here too, right? You have, you have customers saying that, you know, hey, my, my landscape's looking bad or, you know, a greens committee saying, hey, the golf course is really, really look, starting to look bad. And, and, you know, you can pull up something like this and say, well, here's why, you know, we're, we're in drought, you know, whether it's extreme or, or, or severe or what. Um, it, it's a really nice tool to help you uh, pay attention to, to the water and, and see exactly where you're at, you know, even county by county. Um, turf response to heat and drought. I would guess that this would apply to uh, just about any plant. Um, and it's exactly what you would think, right? So um, as your water content goes down, um, your turf quality goes down. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's going to come as a shock to anyone. Um, and we see here tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass. This is going to be the same on any turf in the world. Um, as your water content goes down, your, your turf quality is going to go down. Now, uh, they are breeding um, many new varieties of plants that are much more drought tolerant, um, particularly in the Bermuda grasses. Uh, so that's always something to consider going forward. But, um, you know, they... Plants, plants don't like to be without water. Um, and as you can see, turf quality, as, as that water drops and as temperature increases, um, it goes down rapidly. Okay, so um, just drought, just heat, um, we start to struggle. But when you take the two, drought and heat, uh, we see on this line very, very quickly our turf quality uh, goes down. And again, this, this should be true for just about any plant out there. Um, so the sooner that uh, we, we can start mitigating with the tools that we're going to talk about, uh, you know, you want to stay on this line as, as long as you can. Um, and oftentimes, uh, waiting until you get down here in, in quality, um, it may be too late, right? So uh, we'll talk about these tools that we have at our disposal in a little bit. Um, you know, proactiveness is, is certainly a, a, a better way. Preventative is better than curative when it comes to drought. Um, so we can look at some of these pictures. Um, and, I, and I threw these in because this is all drought. Um, I think that, you know, some of these would, would be pretty hard to, to diagnose in the field without um, really, you know, being aware of, of what's going on in the world, knowing that you're in the drought, knowing where your, your precipitation levels have been, particularly in the trees. Uh, for me personally, coming out of the turf industry, you know, you have one tree here that's, you know, really gone and another one that's struggling. Um, you know, hey, is that, a, is that an insect? Is that a pest? Um, you know, I, I don't know that I would guess drought first without some background knowledge, you know, maybe going to the drought monitor and that sort of thing. Um, these abelias, you know, losing their leaves up top like this, you know, these are going to be their younger leaves, and um, that's certainly an indicator, uh, but that could just as easily be, you know, pest damage or, or disease damage of some sort. So um, really understanding the plant that you're dealing with, really understanding what the environmental conditions have been um, is going to be really important in diagnosing some of this stuff so, we, so we're not, you know, just throwing out uh, pesticides for no reason. It's one of my favorite pictures of severe drought. Um, I, I don't think too many of us see this too often, but um, you know this one. This one should be pretty clear. Uh, this is this is lack of water. Um, but again, you know, you could say, well, maybe there are army worms, or maybe there there was this that that, you know, ravaged all this. Uh, so really paying attention. And um, here's, here's your watering restrictions that we talked about earlier, right? As you get into drought, um, you know, you start getting watering restrictions and then your, your plants actually suffer even worse. So as you're entering that drought, again, you know, preventative is always better than curative because you don't know if something like this is coming, right? The thing about, thing about drought is um, there's, there's 
there's no, there's, there's really no way to tell when it's going to end. Um, you know, I'm, I'm down here in the Southeast and generally in the summertime at, at some point or another, uh, the rain turns off and, and it does that almost every year. And, uh, we don't know it, when it's going to turn off. We don't know when it's going to turn back on. Um, and, and the whole goal is that we get through it, you know, without dealing with this sort of stuff. So, um, some of the impacts of drought and water ability, increased pesticide use, right? So the first thing we said was, um, you know, misdiagnosis uh, creates uh, in, an increased pesticide use, and it does, but also uh, plants under drought stress are going to be more susceptible uh, to actual pests that need pesticide use, right? Um, higher water bills, stress turf and landscapes. You, you don't want your customers complaining that things are uh, looking bad when you're doing everything right, except for managing water. Um, that, that should be an easy part. Um, turf and plant removal replacement, it's costly, uh, it's burdensome, um, loss of business re revenue, unhappy customers, um, they're, all, they're all tied together. So uh, drought stress leads to an increase in pesticide use, and maybe I jumped the gun and told you about this slide before I got to it, but um, you know, identifying and understanding landscape stressors, right, so drought stress is often misidentified as a pest problem, and then pesticides for the misidentified problem are used. And then the effects of drought stress on turf and ornamentals, drought stress weakens the plant and can open the door for secondary invaders like disease or pests. So moisture adversely affects virtually every physiological process in the plant. Um, there's very little in your plant that doesn't need water to actually do. So as soon as it gets uh, under some drought stress, um you will start having the physiological processes in the plant shut shut down which opens the door for opportunistic diseases and pests so the first response of of a plant under drought stress uh, is a closure of leaf stomata okay so this reduces transpiration water loss and acts as a defense mechanism transpiration is essentially the way that a plant cools itself down so now with the stomata closed carbon dioxide can't be absorbed Photosynthesis is curtailed. So if a plant's all of its energy comes from photosynthesis and, and that starts getting shut down, um, that's, that's where you know, we're really gonna start seeing the problems. You're really gonna start seeing it in the plant, um, various problems, leaf drop, brownness, that sort of thing. And then the reduction in photosynthesis limits growth, um, which is gonna mean that it's not gonna be able to grow out of those problems like it normally would. You'll have stunted plants and it also increases the susceptibility to insects and disease pests. Um, some drought stress enhanced issues uh, in turf, um, anthracnose, grub damage, uh, chinch bugs, uh, crabgrass breakthrough from pre-emerge, broadleaf weeds, traffic wear, uh, visibility and damage from summer patch tends to all become worse during drought. And, and in trees and ornamentals, uh, borer attacks, bark beetles, ambrosia or stem beetles, amaria, amaria root rot, mm, sorry, uh, cytospora canker, stiplers like mites and lace bugs. Um, you know, these things all become worse during drought. Um, and, and I'm sure others, the, these were top of the head um, ideas that, that I know, uh, you know, in drought affected plants become worse. <clears throat> Not only do they become worse, but the damage that they do becomes worse, all right? So something like a, like a root rot, um, you know, there are true fungal pathogens and then there are fungal-like pathogens. So, um, you know, everybody know. generally we talk about diseases um, needing moisture and they do, right? It's part of the disease triangle, um, particularly for, for our fungal diseases. Um, but some of these don't need a lot of water. So you can actually be in a period of, of relative drought, maybe have one good thunderstorm in an afternoon that doesn't take you out of drought, but still pick up the, the diseases like Fusarium or Rhizoctonia. And when that occurs, um, you tend to get uh, much, much, much more damage to the plants than you would otherwise. Um, so uh, you know, rust and powdery mildew is, is another leaf disease. They really only need brief periods of moisture that even just do um, 
can, can create these diseases. Um, and then they only need wind to spread. So um, I'm not saying that these are more common in droughty years, um, but damage during dry years tends to be much, much worse for some of these diseases. So uh, strategy against drought, tips and tools to reduce drought stress and maintain healthier plants, All right? Um, the right plant in the right place, that's, that's always number one. Um, you know, put, put, put a plant that loves the sun in the sun, don't put it in the shade. Uh, improve turf varieties, uh, we talked about that. Thatch management and, and core aeration, we're talking turf there. Um, you know, general practices uh, that you should be doing uh, with turf, your mechanical, cultural practices are gonna be important there. Um, soil barriers and mulch, obviously, uh, uh, mulch and those sorts of things help slow down the evaporative rate. Um, super absorbent polymers or high gels, wetting agents or surfactants, and hygroscopic humectants. And also some bio, biostimulants and PGRs can, can certainly um, help along the ways. So uh, we're gonna focus today on our water management tools. Uh, uh, so super absorbent polymers, wetting agents or surfactants, and hygroscopic humectants. Uh, there are two types of superabsorbent polymers, uh, a soluble linear or an insoluble cross-link. So a soluble, a soluble linear dissolves in water. Um, these are used mostly for reducing irrigation-induced erosion in fields, and the insoluble forms a gel with water. So they're most commonly used in the landscape. We really don't see too many of these used um, in the turf industry, but Products like TerraZorb, TurboZorb, WaterZorb, HydraZorb, and many others. Um, I think we can all guess by the name what they do. Uh, they absorb water. Um, some of them, you know, eight or uh, 800 or 1,000 times their weight in water. Um, they are good. They have their place. Um, I've seen them used, um, but, and they're good for ornamental and color installation. Um, they can reduce wilt and water requirements of new plantings. They cannot be incorporated into uh, established turf, and I should probably say plantings as well. Um, they can only absorb water when it's pl plentiful, and there is some concern of degradation speed. Uh, some of these kind of don't last very long. Um, you'll see little crystals, and, and they, they get nice and big and fat. We did a, uh, I used to sell, um, at a previous poll, I had a customer that really liked TerraZorb uh, for new plantings. And they're these tiny little BBs and they swell up to about the size of a golf ball if you drop them in water. Um, and they kind of, here's some of the uh, examples of what these will look like. Again, these are really only good for um, installs. You, you can't really get these into where they need to be um, after the fact. Um, most common forms of polymers in the landscape. Uh, starch grafted polymers, they're soil moist. Oh, there's a, a pterosorb there, uh, cross link polyacrylamides, um, stockosorb, and cross link acrylamide acrylate copolymers. These are big words, guys, but um, generally speaking, again, um, only, only really good for installs. Um, and there are some cautions, right? So follow the label instructions. Do not use more than the recommended amount, no matter what you think. Um, I have seen a whole um, tree get pushed out of the ground that um, they put handfuls and handfuls of, of one of these products in and then we had a big rain and they all swole up um, and it actually picked the tree out of the ground. So um, follow the label on that one. Um, there's some concerns over root rot and fungus development. Um, because you do have a lot of water holding in that spot. And there have been some studies that indicate that polymers might compete against plant for water in extreme drought conditions. So they hold water so well that they might not be giving it back to the plant um, when the plant needs it. Um, so <clears throat> now we'll talk about um, kind of our our products that we can use after, after planting, right? Like I said, uh, the, the polymer gels, those are really for installs. Um, 
but we'll give a quick brief, uh, how, how, you know, what the water molecule is to really understand how uh, surfactants, wetting agents, and that sort of thing works. So water is a polar molecule. Okay, so uh, two hydrogens and an oxygen, um, meaning uh, polar, meaning that there is an uneven distribution of electron density. So water has a partial negative charge near the oxygen atom due to the unshared pair of electrons and a partial positive charge near the hydrogen atom. And that is really, really important here. Um, if these two hydrogen uh, atoms were actually on the middle of this oxygen atom on either side, rather than uh, being down lower, um, we would probably not be having this conversation because it would no longer be a uh, polar molecule. And a lot of the problems that we have getting uh, water into, into soil would not exist. Um, <clears throat> Um, surface tension. So another significant trait of water is surface tension. Surface tension is the tendency of the surface molecules of a liquid to be attracted toward the center of the liquid body. Surface tension is why a single water drop, droplet on wax paper appears as though it has a tense elastic membrane surrounding it. Few liquids have a higher surface tension than water. So basically, um, surface tension um, is is keeping that water as a drop, right? That's that's so here we are. Uh, when soil surfaces become nonpolar, water molecules attract to each other and not the soil. Okay, so we have um, adhesion and cohesion. Um, adhesion would be the the water molecule attracts to the soil, or say um, you know, a, a leaf blade, right? The fact that a water molecule can stick to that, that's adhesion. Uh, but cohesion is a water molecule sticking to itself. Um, that's why it's going to form that um, almost spherical um, droplet. And what happens over time, um, soil surfaces can become nonpolar, and that generally is going to occur from uh, some sort of organic coating. And, and we're talking about on the the particular grain of soil, um, and that gets multiplied across the actual uh, soil as a whole. So what will happen is the water will try to stick to itself um, rather than than going in, and it will you'll you'll find repellency. Uh, so um, we we have poor infiltration and poor penetration, and it can become very difficult to actually you know seem like it's like it should be a thing but it can actually become hard you can pour water on something and you'll see it sit on top of the ground or move to a different spot um, here's the hydrophobic soil on the left and a, or on, on the right rather um, non-hydrophobic on the left so this water entered into the soil this water just beat it up sitting on the top and this is what this is what we're trying to fix with uh, surfactants and wetting agents generally. It's hydrophobic soil. Um, you can see here um, another example going in here, getting stuck. And this is a, a great picture. I uh, hand watered a lot of greens in my lifetime and you can pound water and pound water and it just sits there on top and moves someplace else. And the spot where it's moving from is generally gonna be your dry spot. Um, there are lots of these pictures uh, that you can find that uh, a lot of them have done been done in university studies uh, trying to figure out exactly how wetting agents and surfactants work, um, you know, which ones are better than others, etc. Um, but imagine here, <clears throat> all of this dark color is where your water is going, right? So all of the soil that's not this color is staying dry, even though you're watering. So your plants above that, they're gonna stay dry. They're, they're not gonna be able to get this water over here. Um, and, and this is uh, where we start seeing localized dry spots. Um, you know, you can have one plant that looks fantastic and right beside it, a, a plant that's, that's really starting to struggle. So uh, wetting agents and surfactants, right? That's, that's what we're talking about here. Water repellency. Water droplets are collections of polar molecules that are attracted to other polar areas. 
and water repellency is caused by a range of hydrophobic organic materials that form non-polar coatings on soils. So where water is polar, it's going to attract to itself. Uh, when it hits non-polar soil, it's going to basically um, essentially push away from that, not, not allow it to, to penetrate that. So a wetting agent is a substance that reduces the surface tension of liquid, causing the liquid to spread across or penetrate more easily the surface of a solid. So we're going to go from that water drop um, into a flatter surface. And a surfactant, also called a surface active agent, that's where the word surfactant comes from, is a substance such as a detergent that can reduce the surface tension of a liquid and thus allow it to foam or penetrate solids. Uh, a wetting agent is a surfactant. A surfactant may not be a wetting agent. So we have a, a treated water molecule. We looked at the uh, what it looks like earlier. So <clears throat> now we have our hydrophilic end and a hydrophobic end of, of our wetting agent. Um, inside of that water droplet, when this is all mixed together, um, we have the hydrophilic end inward. That's going to attract the water. We have the hydrophobic end outward. Um, surface tension is reduced as water molecules push outward towards the hydrophilic of surfactant. So the little brown parts, here we go. Uh, this is actually going to, the, the hydrophobic end will, will grab the sand, um, and then the nonpolar end uh, will grab the water, and it will help it to, to move through. Um, surfactants have a water-soluble group and an oil-soluble group. Um, this is a very, very, very basic um, drawing. I understand that. Um, but just to get the general idea of what we're doing here, um, again, we're going to uh, hit the nonpolar, um, grab a hold to the nonpolar soil, uh, whether that's sand, silk, clay, and the water will attract to the other end of that so that it can eventually seep through. Um, <clears throat> There's your wedding agent, there's your polar head of your wedding agent. I should have pushed the button one more time there. Uh, so now our water can be attached to here, which is attached to um, the soil and actually penetrate. Um, chemistries and formulations vary, very, very widely um, and, and performance of different chemistries vary. Um, I, I could, we, we could do a, a whole hour at least on, on the different, um, chemistries that are that are available, whether they're uh, block plus APG, whether they're uh, reverse block polymers or alkali polyglucide surfactants. Um, there, there are lots of different types. Um, a little, a little much to go through here, um, but there, there are lots of different options and chemistries available to you that generally all work. They all do what they're supposed to do, right? Um, they help water move through and they can reduce drought stress by reducing uh, loss to runoff, right? They help water move through the soil. So, um, you know, if they move in, then, then you don't have as much runoff. Um, you get more even uh, dispersion of water in soil. Um, there's a lot of studies that have been done that actually go off label. Um, you know, if it says put 16 ounces once a month, they'll put eight ounces every two weeks. And uh, generally, most of those studies have indicated that that way is better. The more often you can do it, the better off you are. Um, so wetting agents are going to improve soil water intera interaction, which is penetration. That's, that's what we need out of water and soil. Uh, we're gonna reduce surface tension of water, uh, provide even water distribution, and you can actually see some temporary dew reduction. Um, so in golf, that's, that's a big thing and, and a reason for, for them to be used. Um, but your four main uh, reasons to use surfactants is gonna be to remove or remedy L, uh, localized dry spot, that's LDS, to manage water, to improve drainage, and to move pesticides in the soil. So a lot of fungicides, uh, insecticides that need to get down into the soil um, will be put out with a surfactant. Um, four major groups, anionic, cationic, uh, non-ionic, and amphoretic. Um, non-ionic surfactants are definitely the most popular due uh, to safety and compatibility with other products. Uh, the original uh, versions of, of some of these 
Uh, we're a bit uh, phytotoxic, so you don't see those really used anymore on the market. Um, so there's there's kind of a, um, not much worry with damage and that sort of thing with these. Um, Non-ionic is, is definitely the, the, the most frequently used at this time. And, and there's um, some examples, right? And it's kind of interesting, um, you know, is it a penetrant? Is it a wetting agent? Is it long-term? Is it short-term? Um, some of those examples, Lesco Flow Ultra, Cascade Plus, PBS 150, 1690, one putt, um, Respawn, Lesco Wet, TriCure. Look, there are hundreds and maybe thousands of different types of wetting agents. I think every distributor has uh, their own brand. Um, there are lots of different companies that make these things. Um, again, you know, this, this isn't the time to talk about which one is best for you. Um, but, um, if, if anyone's interested, I would highly recommend, uh, looking at, uh, Dr. Saldat's work from the University of Wisconsin. Um, he has done wedding agent work for, I think the last 14 or 15 years or something like that. And he has put basically all of them through the same test year in, year out. Um, and, and according to him and a, a presentation I watched of his just a few months ago, basically all you really need to focus on here is the amount of active ingredient, right? If, if it is a lot of active ingredient, so if, if the vast majority of, of the makeup of that is an active ingredient and it's a high rate, it will be a penetrant. It will help move water into the soil. It will help eradicate hydrophobic soils. If it is a low active ingredient percentage in the bottle or low use rates, it's a wetting agent. It's going to help water um, coat leaf blades better. It's going to help them um, uh, manage that cohesion properties better um, so that uh, your, your water droplet will more evenly um, hit your target and spread out better to cover better. That, that's essentially what his work has shown. So um, one product over the other, uh, it's maybe take your pick. Um, everybody has their, their own that they like, but uh, again, Dr. Soldat is, has done some pretty good research on, on these. And now, uh, lastly, we'll, we'll talk about hygro, hygroscopic humectants. Um, this is a category that gets lumped into surfactants and wetting agents, but they're really, they're, they're really their own uh, special product, their own category, um, all by themselves as a uh, uh, moisture um, management tool. Uh, so hygroscopic means absorbing or attracting moisture from the air, and humectant is a substance that absorbs or helps another substance retain moisture. So a hygroscopic humectant, humectant is gonna take um, uh, evaporative water, and recondense it into usable water by the plant. So a blend of compounds designed to convert soil moisture vapor into plant usable droplets as a means to manage soil moisture in between irrigation or rainfall. So as <clears throat> it's gonna rain or irrigation is gonna run, gravity is gonna take that water down into the soil. As it warms up and dries out, capillary pressure is gonna move that, that water back up and in between the top, uh, of all that, you're going to have evaporative water that's going to be lost. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, slowing that rate down and, and using that evaporative water to, uh, to help the plant in between um, those rainfalls or those irrigation events. Um, you lose water uh, in, in your soil by a few different ways. You have runoff, right, particularly on hillsides, topography matters. Um, gravity, right? Sometimes your water doesn't get to come back up. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit groundwater. It's going to uh, recharge that, which is a very good thing for all of us. Um, transpiration or evapotranspiration um, is actually where the plant uses it to, to sort of cool itself down. It it it's, uh, absorbs the water and, and uh, exits the plant that way. And then evaporation. And that's the process by which soil moisture is directly lost to the atmosphere above. And we want to slow that down as much as possible. We want to get everything we can get out of, out of our water and, and use it uh, to the best of our ability. 
So hygroscopic humectants are going to reduce evaporative loss. Subsurface moisture vapor is unavailable to, to the plants, just as we're unable to drink the humidity in the air around us. So no matter, just about no matter where you are, you're probably in, a, in some sort of humidity. You can't drink it. The plants can't drink evaporative water either. They can't, they can't drink that moisture vapor. They need it to be recondensed. So by attracting and storing water vapor molecules, hygroscopic humectants create microscopic, microscopic droplets, uh, similar to watching condensation form on a cold glass. So, uh, a good visual there, I think we can all imagine. Um, and this process helps plants use soil moisture vapor that would otherwise be unavailable and lost. So we're just as, as efficiently as we possibly can getting everything we can out of the water that's available to us. Um, hygroscopic humectants uh, can eliminate or minimize drought stress. Uh, eliminate's a big word and I'm happy to use that here because they, they really can. Um, and we've seen it over and over and over and over again. Uh, whether it's um, in between drought or irrigation that's not efficient or, you know, frankly, plants that don't get water, you know, even just relying on, on nature and, and rainfall. Um, we've, seen, we've seen that totally eliminated. Um, reduce overall watering requirements so they allow you to cut your water back. If you're paying for water, if you have some of that bad water that we talked about earlier, you want to use less of it, um, they'll allow you to do that. They'll enhance nutrient uptake. We just had a great study done that showed that um, uh, plants using hygroscopic humectants actually absorb water or nutrients better. Um, they can control or even eliminate localized dry spots, uh, improve transplant establishment, um, increase seed germination, maximize crop production, um, which also, you know, anytime I'm talking about crops, not just ag, but um, how well is your turf growing? How well are your, are your ornamentals growing? What, what does your flower bed look like? Um, accelerate crop grow in uh, and extend retail shelf life. So um, lots of different ways to use these um, out in the field. Um, and we'll do a couple uh, pictures here. Um, uh, so Hydrotain is, is our product manufactured by Ecologel. Um, this is a golf course fairway. Uh, with a rock cap here that they suffered from from this uh, droughty area year in year out had tried lots of different wetting agents um, never never really had success um, because that's that's not what they're designed to do um, and after one treatment um, and I believe this gentleman still still today uses hydrotain um, in this golf course <clears throat> um, it's not just me talking about it, university studies. Um, here's 30 days at 60%, 40% um, uh, water reduction. Uh, you can see the control here. This is a granular hydrotain. This is a liquid hydrotain. Um, look, it's, it's not a miracle product. We're talking about 40% less water than the plant actually needs. Uh, so we're still gonna see you know, some drought stress here, uh, but, but compared to the control over here, you know, that, that's a really a night and day difference. And I mentioned several times early that um, curative is never as good as preventative. And um, this picture is, is, you know, proof right here that, you know, having this out before you go into drought stress, uh, give, give your plants some water and, and the, they can bounce right back. You know, they, they, were, they weren't nearly as stressed as this one. They were still a little brown, but um, you know, look at where our control is that just had water and um, go tell your customers why, why their turf looks like this now after you finally did get a rain event. Um, I'm a, I'm a, this is one of my favorite pictures um, that, that we have in, in our arsenal for hydrotain. It, it just really shows that um, it really does a very good job at managing your, your, your plants in between uh, drought um, and really just the, the, the preventative effects, you know, when, when you get it out before your plant really goes into, into stress. Um, I mentioned a, a study we did, Western Illinois, um, turf grass tree with hydrotain, irrespective of a formulation, um, used 52 to 56% less water than controls per gram of dry matter produced. Um, and we also have here um, the various levels of 
uh, nutrients that were taken up. Um, and you can see just about across the board, um, you know, iron maybe was probably one that's that that may it's more, but maybe not statistically uh, difference. Um, but our nitrogen uh, considerably more, you know, if you look on the back of uh, look on any any herbicide label, and I talk about this one a lot, um, that, you know, you, you're going to see a there's going to be a line somewhere on that herbicide label that says something to the effect of plants under drought stress are not going to be able to take this up as well. Um, and I always I always thought that that would have to be the case um, for nutrients as well. Um, the, the same idea, the same principle. Um, and and we, we did a study and it turns out that, that we were correct about that, that your plants will take up uh, more nutrients while using a, a hygroscopic humectant like hydrotain. Um, Another study very early on uh, when hydrotain first hit the market, um, we've never seen another water management product that came close to doubling the time a plant could go without water. That's from uh, Jim Barrett, um, professor at Florida. Um, <clears throat> we, were, we were looking at uh, pots and uh, plants in pots here, um, but really, uh, really neat to have, you know, this university backing on our, on our product line here. Um, Clemson University, this was a side-by-side -side of poinsettia um, on the edge of plants. And, and I'm kind of trying to show you a lot of this, uh, really to say that, that there's not, it, it's the one part I don't like about hydrotain is that I, I hate to say, well, you can put it on any plant because, um, you know, you get kind of, is that real or not? But, you know, we've put it to the test. Is it turf? Is it flowers? Are they trees? Are they ornamentals? Are they, you know, shrubbery in the ground? Um, time and time again on, on plant after plant after plant, um, you know, we've seen that, that hygroscopic humectants work and they work well. Um, and it's, it's not just us, it's, it's um, some university trials and data that, that are kind of showing it. So we're, we're very proud of these studies and um, hope that, that you'll, um, look to these as, as we start entering these times of year where um, we can really be um, really beneficial in, in your programs and, and for your, your plants in general. We got field support for you. Um, I'm in the Southeast, Kevin Lewis here in the Midwest and the Northeast, Rebecca Knapp out in, uh, out in the West. We talk about hydrotain a lot and uh, managing our water and obviously um, all of our Arborjet RTMs uh, in your area, reach out to uh, either one of us um, on, on either side of the business and, and we'll try to help you in any way that we can. So thank you again, everyone. I know, uh, again, Monday's a tough day to, to take an hour out a lot of time. So um, I greatly appreciate you all coming today, uh, spending an hour with me and letting me talk about um, drought stress and as part of your IPM program. So thanks a lot, everyone.